It is Monday, which means another Mock Draft Monday. It is the 15th of April, meaning we are just 10 days away from the 2024 NFL Draft. Of course, we'll be live on this channel, youtube.com slash bengal, live reacting to every pick with analysis for each spot, each fit as well. It's always a ton of fun. It's always crazy. And we'll see if we can kind of display some of that craziness here in a special two-round Mock Draft today as hopefully I'll be able to teach you guys about some of the players that are slightly down the board that aren't really expected to go in the first round. So we'll talk about some of those guys today as well. I've done it before, but we're closer to the draft now. Of course, for teams like the Panthers and Browns without first round picks, should be a fun exercise as well. Not going to spend too much time on number one. It's Caleb Williams. I've had this for about as long as the Bears have had the number one overall pick. You know, it just seems to be that Caleb Williams was always going to be the guy no matter who picked here, whether a trade down or something else. The Bears get their QB1 of the future, and hopefully he ends up developing more than Justin Fields did in Chicago. At number two, it's where things get slightly more interesting. Right now, I'm going to make the pick for Jaden Daniels from LSU. I happen to prefer Drake May, and I get that it's close. Jaden Daniels has a higher upside as a runner, and Drake May can run too, but just not quite to the same level. And to the same degree, I think Drake May is a better passer than Jaden Daniels. And that goes into his upside with his arm talent. Jaden Daniels is just not on that same level. Now, yes, he's extremely accurate downfield outside the numbers. No question about that. The accuracy is fantastic. Drake May is accurate downfield, but has the arm to hit these tight window throws that you're going to see more frequently in the NFL. And Jaden Daniels, I'm not sure, is quite to that same level. And Drake May also younger. Higher upside maybe for that reason. He would have more hype if he didn't have the worst offensive line in college football nearly Colorado in that conversation. And he lost all of his weapons. You know, no Josh Downs equals some problems. Got Tez Walker back half of this year as well as a good player. Might see him later in this video as well. But um, seems like things are lining up for Jaden Daniels to go to the Commanders at number two. Really fun player. Should be a good fit with Cliff Kingsbury. Kind of like what he did with Kyler Murray. A guy that didn't really throw over the middle ever, but went outside the numbers deep down the field. That was the LSU offense. So, might be a fairly seamless transition as far as it goes for rookie quarterbacks there for Jaden Daniels. At number three. Again, things could get interesting here. Patriots met with J.J. McCarthy. What does that mean? It means they're doing their due diligence. Does that mean that J.J. McCarthy's going at number three overall? Of course not, but it could happen. It could, right? And I know it's, oh, J.J. McCarthy, he'll be there in round two or three. No, he won't be. He won't be. M maybe, maybe round two, because if one or two teams pass on a QB, the options of who would take a first-round quarterback get very limited, right? But we expect the Vikings, Broncos, Raiders, all of these teams are going to be in the market for a QB. I think it's hard to believe that J.J. McCarthy would fall out of even the top 20 at this point, but does he go all the way up to number three? I don't know that I believe that either, and it could be a receiver, I guess, or a tackle and Joe Alt. I'm going Drake May here. I just think it's so tough to find that franchise guy at QB, and if the Patriots like Drake May, that's who the pick's going to end up being, of course. It's easier to find an offensive lineman down the board or a receiver down the board, especially in a monster receiver class. You can't really find that QB down the board. Drake May is the third pick. At number four, the Cardinals have been a popular trade-up spot for me lately. Today, I'm going to keep things as they are. I'm going Marvin Harrison Jr., and I do think the Vikings will try to trade up. I think the Giants could, right? I think the Broncos, Raiders could be in that conversation, but the asking price may end up being too high, and a trade may just not end up getting done when you factor in that Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board and available, and the Cardinals really could use a big-time wide receiver one. They have nobody there right now. It's just really Michael Wilson. No Rondell Moore, no Hollywood Brown. Not that either of those guys would have stopped you from taking Marvin Harrison Jr. at number four anyway, but you stick and pick and get a really good player. As we get to the Chargers at number five, another spot that has been very difficult to mock for because do the Chargers go offensive line when they have maybe more pressing needs elsewhere, but maybe the team identity that, you know, Jim Harbaugh is going to want is power run. Build in the trenches. That's what worked at Michigan, right? They really need receiver. Brock Bowers could be really fun. They could trade down, but yet again, 
I'm not going to have that happen. I just think receiver is such a big need, and with a player like Malik Neighbors on the board, the Chargers might opt to just take the best player available, and Neighbors is in that conversation. If they didn't trade Keenan Allen and, and cut Mike Williams, you know, it, I could totally get on board with something else, and I still can, right? Because just like I said with the Cardinals, you know, you could take receiver down the board. You don't have to at four or five. Well, you know, you still got to have something better out there than Quentin Johnston, Josh Palmer for one more year, and Darius Davis. I, I refuse to believe that their primary return man is going to be heavily featured in the offense in the case of Darius Davis. We'll have to see. Neighbors just makes a lot of sense. At the same time, Greg Roman, new offensive coordinator for the Chargers, historically has not prioritized the receiver position. Instead, has loved tight ends. Does Brock Bowers go at number five, though? Tough to say. Giants at six. I'm going to go Roma Dunze here. I think Odunze is a phenomenal player. He's in this first tier of receivers for a reason. Does everything so well. Great body control, great hands, great ability to beat press. He's got the nuances down as a route runner and as a receiver in general. And also is quite a good athlete. I think all three of these receivers can be wide receiver ones in the NFL. Neighbors has potential to be a Z or a slot guy, can move around. He doesn't have the body frame of a typical like X style receiver, but we've seen smaller guys do it fine. And he's six foot, you know, and, and has unbelievable play strength, especially after the catch. So he can be an outside wide receiver one. That's not even a question for me, but at the same time, you know, he could also play the Z as well. And these guys have the more prototypical wide receiver one body types. Harrison Jr. 6'4", 205. Adunze is also pretty big at 6'3", 215. And the Giants could desperately use a true X wide receiver one. Roma Dunze is that guy. This video is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. And if you act quickly, you can get the Shohei Otani surprise special for higher than half a plate appearance. So if he comes up to hit, you get it. I decided to pair that with Matt Olson, higher eight and a half fantasy points. I think he's got a great matchup tonight because he's facing Spencer Aragetti, who was very rough in his big league debut, now facing arguably the best offense in baseball, especially if you consider last season. So I have him higher one and a half first to third innings runs allowed. He allowed seven earned runs against the Royals, who are hot, but the Braves are just better. If you live in one of the yellow states, you're eligible to play Pick'em Classic. One of the blue states, you can play Pick'em Champions. And when you use code BANGLE, you'll get a first-time deposit match up to $100, meaning if you put in $50, they will give you a free $50 when you use code BANGLE all the way up to $100. Thank you to Underdog for sponsoring this video. Three quarterbacks in a row and then three straight receivers to kickstart the NFL draft and no trades. Do we see a trade here at number seven? It's going to be Joe Alt. And I know we're all probably getting tired of that selection, but you shouldn't be. He's a really good player and has the potential to be your franchise left tackle for a long time. The Titans, I know they could use help at receiver, but your tackle spots are horrendous. Left and right. All plug and play left tackle. You need it desperately. And to new head coach Brian Callahan, you get to work with arguably the best offensive line coach in the NFL, right up there with Jeff Stoutland and Bill Callahan. And that is a tremendous fit. And that speaks to the true development that you could see with Joe Alt. You team him up with an off or awesome offensive line coach. It's been amazing in the NFL developing talent over the past couple of decades, right? And Alt has all of the tools. He's a great athlete. And the tapes are really, really good if you check out 2023. Even better than 2022. So he continues to get better and better and better. He's such a great athlete. I don't see a way the Titans pass on him at number seven. But at number eight... J.J. McCarthy's kind of sticking on the board a little bit here. I've had him inside the top four or five recently, maybe even at six. I don't think I've had him to the Giants yet, but it, it could happen. But this is the range where you could see a trade-up. And even though the Vikings move up and get number 23, well, from a move up from 11 to 8, I'm not sure that it would cost two first-round picks. So the Vikings here... Could move, I mean, 23 and a first next year would be interesting, but I'm sure what it would actually be is number 11 for Minnesota for number eight. Plus, they don't pick again until 108. Ooh, that's very interesting for Minnesota. The Broncos also don't have a second round pick. 
So you almost wonder, do they keep 23 and trade a future one? Or would you trade 23, keep your first next year, and then the Falcons would give you value in return, such as maybe number 79 from Jacksonville? That would be interesting. Now, of course, maybe you don't think that's quite enough value. And, of course, the trade only has 12% chance to be accepted according to the Pro Football Focus trade simulator here. However, it just is inherently more expensive to trade for a quarterback. We've seen it time and time again. The Giants got two first-round picks when the Bears moved up for Justin Fields, and that was from, like, 20-ish to 11, something in that neighborhood. So 11 to 8, two first-round picks seems like way too much, right? But maybe you can get 74 back and maybe you can get like a fourth next year or something like that. It is more expensive to trade for a quarterback. And as I've said, people have disagreed with this. That's fine. It doesn't really matter what the exact specifications of the trade happen to be as long as the team is moving up here. We never know what a team would give up for a player or for a pick. But, uh, you know, in this scenario, McCarthy falls a little bit, but the Vikings still have to give up multiple first round picks and you know what maybe maybe the falcons give up 43 right and then you know i don't know it, like it could go any number of different ways here i know it's blocked on the screen here but um we're gonna do 74 and maybe a future three actually and that that boosts the percentage up a little bit but it seems like a lot to move up for the vikings however it is expensive to move up for a QB. We've seen it time and time again. Look at what the 49ers gave up to move up for Trey Lance. Look at, and that was into the top three, I get it. And Mitch Trubisky, look at that trade. The Bears gave up so much to move up one spot to ensure that they got Mitch Trubisky. With the Broncos and Raiders potentially trying to move up for a QB, it is going to be expensive. Falcons happen to hold all the cards here. Vikings move up and it does end up being J.J. McCarthy for me. And yes, I recognize that you think, okay, we don't have to trade up. Why would we do that? I really think that the Vikings moved up to 23 to move that pick away and probably try and trade into the top three, but it doesn't end up happening. They keep that pick and then move up to eight because McCarthy's still sticking on the board. So that's a, a case of, hey, the Patriots maybe don't want to trade away number three, but the Vikings are still really interested in a quarterback, but not for the asking price of what the Chargers or Cardinals may have been asking for. So... It's a possibility. I think that's a kind of a fun experiment there. But, you know, of course, what exactly would the trade specifications be? We don't know. It is all speculation. At number nine, the Bears have been one of the toughest teams to mock for the entire process for me. And I still don't know exactly what they do. You look at their picks. They have just one nine, 75, and 122. Four picks in the entire draft. You'd think that they end up moving down. But in order for a team to move down, move down somebody's got to be moving up for something. And based on who's available, I'm not sure that that would happen. So I think the Bears may be in a situation where they stick and pick. And we're going to turn in the card for Jared Verse Edge from Florida State. Just maybe a bit of a better fit for their 4-3 defense. I think Dallas Turner could get it done, right? But Verse might be just a little bit of a better fit. Had a top 30 visit with the Bears, I think, as well. So, you know, you can connect the dots there a little bit as we get to the Jets at 10. And I certainly think that this could end up being Brock Bowers. And that's who it's going to end up being for me here. Bowers, I think, could be a top 10 pick. I think the talent says he's a top 5 guy, but he plays tight end. And he didn't test. We know he's athletic, but is he a super freak athlete? Or is he just, yeah, he's, pretty, he's very athletic. But is he you know, worth actually taking in the top 10. It is uh, very interesting. I would say the tape says yes. His ability to just totally destroy pursuit angles is extremely impressive for a tight end. He can catch screens. He's got really good hands, but especially is amazing after the catch and can work downfield. He just does everything great as a receiver and can block a little bit as well. I think it's a really fun weapon for Aaron Rodgers to utilize here in Green Bay. Uh, now to the Jets, of course. And we get to finally see what Aaron Rodgers looks like with the Jets. We got, what, a couple plays of it last year, if that. He was injured in the first quarter. But now has arguably the best group of weapons he'll ever have with Brock Bowers, Mike Williams, Garrett Wilson. It's a fun group. 
and we get to the Falcons at number 11 after the trade down. Falcons picked up number 23 and number 11 improbably. And of course, they could potentially get a second round pick from the Vikings. Uh, or excuse me, the, the Vikings could have got a second round pick from Minnesota as well. That's a legitimate possibility. But in this scenario, they've kept all of their picks pretty much. Again, who knows exactly what would happen, but this is what I'm doing here today. And you never know in the NFL. We always have these trades that are like, that trade's so lopsided, but they happen. They do happen. So Falcons at number 11. What are the Falcons opt to do? It's tough for me to go a different direction than Dallas Turner. And I've heard that, oh, Dallas Turner's not edge one on the Falcons board. Well, things may have changed now that you have a new defensive head coach that has been used to running a 3-4 defense in Raheem Morris from, from L.A., I think that Dallas Turner makes a ton of sense for them here at number 11. And that ultimately is who I'm going to end up drafting here with this pick. He's a great, great, great athlete. That's good on tape. He has upside as a pass rusher. Pretty good right now. And is a good run defender as well. Love Dallas Turner. And I think he ends up being a great selection at number 11. Broncos at 12. It's a corner or a defensive lineman, in my opinion. Bo Nix is on the board. I know the Broncos need a quarterback. Would somebody be willing to trade up for a player here? Let's see. I don't know. I think with the tackles, you don't necessarily have to move up for one. Maybe someone moves up for CB1. But who would that be? Jacksonville? Jacksonville is interesting. I know Trent Baalke was at the Senior Bowl. Quinion Mitchell is a senior bowl standout, potentially CB1 in this class. But the Jags also could really use a receiver, in my opinion. And I don't know. I think I think a trade-up's kind of fun here. The Broncos don't have a second round pick. Now, I don't know that the Jags would be giving up a second round pick in this move. I think more than likely, of course, 17, and then maybe you'd trade 96 maybe a third next year or something like that. But it could also be 48 for 12, 17 and 48 for 12. That's a possibility. And you'd be jumping the Raiders who could take a, a corner. You could jump the Colts who could consider a corner. All right, let's do it. The NFL trade value chart, the Jimmy Johnson, of course, classic chart, says that 17, 96 and 114 is about even for 12. We're going to make that trade happen. Jacksonville moves up for their CB1. Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. Phenomenal athlete. Has size at the position that we know Trent Baalke is going to love. Quinion Mitchell just screams CB1 in the NFL. Six foot 200 with 4'3 speed. He is an awesome player. Yes, played in the MAC at Toledo. However, I don't think that matters a ton when he was able to shut guys down the way he did in Mobile at the Senior Bowl and is fast, physical, I think he's definitely got potential to be the first corner off the board. So much so that the Jags go up and trade for him. Kind of an interesting move there. Raiders at 13 probably would have heavily considered Quinion Mitchell. But I think we pivot and go with an offensive lineman. And I think Talisa Fuaga makes a ton of sense here. Plug and play right tackle. I know a lot of people also like him as a guard. And you could definitely see a transition to guard make sense there for the Raiders. Power run, yes, I know they need a QB, but is it Bo Nix at 13? Or do they opt to just take a player that they can be very confident in on the offensive line and address QB at some point in the future? It's so tough to figure out what the, what the Raiders and Broncos might do regarding the quarterback position if things go as expected and the Vikings and the top three teams all end up taking QB. We'll have to see what happens. And I'm, I'm really excited because... We might see a name like Bo Nix go very early. And that would be a shock, but would it be? Because those teams need QB. It'll be interesting to see what ends up happening. Saints at 14, it's always offensive line for me, and it will continue to be. I'm going to go Olu Fashionu here from Penn State. Yes, Fashionu. If you disagree on how to say his last name, you're disagreeing with him. So what do you want to do there? It's Fashionu, I promise you. And that kind of rhymed. 
Saints here desperately need tackle at really left and right side of Ryan Ramchak if his diagnosis and speculation around his knee reigns true. They have holes at both tackle spots, and that's really, really bad for an offense. Fashion here would go over and play left tackle, left tackle at Penn State. One of the best pure pass blockers in the draft. It's a pretty valuable thing. He goes in the top 15. Colts at 15. I've liked Brian Thomas Jr. here quite a lot. Cooper DeGene's pretty fun, though. I'm going to push him back up the board. He's a really good athlete. Could potentially play safety as well. And maybe just even be better as a safety. But I think he can still stick on the outside if you want him to do that. Colts have needs all over the secondary. DeGene fits with the Colts. Fits with what Chris Ballard's going to be looking for. A really good athlete at the, at the position, whether that's corner or safety. They have needs all throughout their secondary. The gene, to me, just makes a ton of sense. And I haven't had him to the Colts for a while now. But he comes off of injury. Really impresses at his pro day. Just not only in the on-field workouts, but of course the testing as well. Medical stuff all comes back clean. The gene could end up being a top 20 pick. I usually have him falling to the Packers. And I'm like, hey, I don't think that's going to happen. But here it happened again. Now we push him up to 15. Seahawks at 16. Board looks pretty good for them. It really does. And I like the idea of Byron Murphy there, but I'm going to go to the true pick here that I always do. And that's Troy Fatanu from Washington. In this scenario, he'd be moving over from tackle to play guard. Seen probably best at guard. And I can certainly agree with that. If you look at him and his pass sets, he, he's definitely good. But I think just because of his aggressiveness, if you watch him, you know, pass pro is not passive. That might work a little bit better on the interior. Although I still think he can stick at guard if you want, or a tackle if you want to do that. I think he might be best served as a guard. And this is a valuable position, right? And the Seahawks, they lose Damian Lewis. You could certainly use an upgrade at guard already. And uh, Fatanu just makes sense here for Seattle, but could play tackle in a pinch if you need that as well. Kick over to the right side if Abe Lucas, you know, can't stay healthy. If something happens to Charles Cross, you can play left tackle in a pinch and you're going to be fine there. Denver back on the clock at 17 after a trade down. I think they'd be pretty happy with Jerzon Newton here and Leatu Latu and Byron Murphy and a cornerback if you want. But we're going to reach, like we're going to go Bo Nix, quarterback from Oregon. I think there's a chance he's a first rounder just purely on the basis that Teams need QB, and you get the fifth-year option on the guy if you take him in the first round. It gives you a little bit more flexibility. The Broncos have never been shy about taking a QB in round one. That's for sure. And you don't have to then worry about a team moving into the back half of the first round to take a QB. You don't have a second rounder, and that's kind of what this came down to for me. It's now or never if you want a QB. Is it going to be Jarrett Stidham in 2024? I don't know that it is. You, you reach up the board and you go with your QB. If he works out, you look like a genius. And he is accurate. He is a good athlete. Oregon Bo Nix is very far from what Auburn Bo Nix was. And I know it's a lot of checking down, a lot of like easy completions in the Oregon offense. Doesn't mean he can't throw downfield. We've seen it. He's good in that capacity as well. I don't know. Bo Nix is one of the most interesting evaluations of any player in this draft. I don't know where he's going to go. I could see him going just outside the top 10. I could see him going outside the top 50, maybe. It's it's an interesting thing. But at the end of the day, QB is a super valuable position. Super valuable. And we see that position get pushed up the board as a result. Well, this worked out pretty well for the Bengals. You have a big need at you know interior defensive line. And the two best ones in the draft are still on the board today. I'm going to go Johnny Jerzon Newton over... Byron Murphy, here's why. Newton, better pass rusher right now. And I think that could be a little bit more useful for the Bengals at this point. Now, you lose DJ Reader. You could certainly sell me on the all-around ability of Byron Murphy. But, you know, sometimes I look at Cincinnati and I just say, you know what, they got a fringe Hall of Fame career from an undersized speed rush interior defensive lineman in Geno Atkins. And Johnny Newton could be up next. Yes, that's obviously high praise to compare him to Geno Atkins. But... There are some parallels there. Not saying he's Geno Atkins, but it, it's it's kind of fun to say, hey, this kind of undersized firecracker interior defensive lineman, 
you know, could be, if all goes well, their next great kind of undersized interior defensive player. And I, I think that's, it's just a fun fit. Rams at 19, I'm going Leatu Latu. You get to keep him in the area, UCLA to Inglewood. Not really a far commute. So Leatu Latu, one of the best players in the draft, of course. Some injury concerns with him, but he's been healthy for a couple seasons now. And I know I make the same argument against Michael Penix, but Latu is so refined as a player. So, so good. Decent athletically as well. Like, let's not say that this guy's a bad athlete when he tested pretty well and he's explosive on tape. He's a great player. Doesn't have tremendous overall length. It's good, I guess. I think 32 and something inch arms, like close to 33. It's like, okay. But um, he's so refined as a pass rusher. What do I mean by that? I mean, not only does he have the plan to attack with the first move, he's got a second. Like, the guy's got counter moves for days. His motor is relentless. This is a guy that I think is going to be a really, really talented NFL player. And guess what? Even if he's never a top five or 10 player in the league at his position, I think he's going to have a very safe floor for you, meaning he will be good. He will be starter caliber, even if he never becomes super elite. And I think that's really valuable there at number 19. Need a big time pass rusher on the edge. You get it with Leatu Latu. Of course, had a really nice season from the rookie in Byron Young. Kobe Turner was great on the inside. You need more help there. You need help in a lot of different places, but Latu is just a surefire, really good player, I think, and you get him at 19. Don't think you can be mad about that. Steelers on the clock at number 20. It's a very interesting spot for me because you have so many good tackles available. Center's a need, and I, I know the Steelers really need a center. I can totally appreciate that, and there are some good ones in this class. Totally. However, I really just want to give them J.C. Latham. I really do. Plug and play starting right tackle. It's a need. Kick Broderick Jones back over to left tackle. I also think a trade down is a possibility here. I'm just a little bit conflicted on what exactly to do here. And I'll tell you, we're going to answer the phone. The Kansas City Chiefs are calling 32, at least, for number 20. And I'll tell you why. Brian Thomas Jr. is still on the board. I think he's going to be a top 20 pick. And this is the floor of that. This is as far as that could go, in my opinion. Brian Thomas Jr. is available. We know the Chiefs need a receiver. Before all this Rasheed Rice nonsense, they needed a receiver. Now they need one even more than ever. I get that they bring in Hollywood Brown for a year. That doesn't impact anything for me. You need to go up and get somebody. And for a team like the Chiefs that are so good, you can afford to move picks to go get your guy. But what does it cost? It's 32 and 64 for 20. And with the trade value chart, that's about even. And the Steelers, I think, are a team that could afford to move down. You got your quarterback, maybe even two. Trading for Justin Fields, you sign Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson, I expect to be the starter. We'll see what happens if he goes down. Justin Fields ready to play. Seen Russ get injured before. But the Chiefs, they are the best team in football about every year. They won the Super Bowl again without any receiving talent, pretty much. But, and I, I know Rasheed Rice had a very good rookie season, but it's just him, right? It's just him. Brian Thomas Jr. gives you a vertical field stretching monster receiver 6'3 210 with low 4'3 speed and it's evident on tape he runs away from people led the entire college football FBS in receiving touchdowns in 2023 the guy can play get him with Patrick Mahomes you got a special type combination there and it is worth moving up to go get your guy and the Chiefs land Brian Thomas Jr. Dolphins now on the clock at 21. Byron Murphy still available. Byron Murphy will be the pick out of Texas. You lose Christian Wilkins, you can replace him just like that with Byron Murphy, the second. Hook him, of course. First Texas player off the board. Gotta love it. He is a really talented player. Great against the run. Can get after the QB as well. Really, really good player. And again, like an easy replacement for a monster in Christian Wilkins. Can he live up to that? Very tough to do that, but 
Murphy's got as good as chance as anybody in this draft class. Really talented player. Eagles on the clock at 22. Well, Terry and Arnold is just still here, and he's still really good. He's got great ability as a cover player. Not an exceptional athlete, but good enough, and he can tackle. He's just somebody that's really fun to watch because he does everything so well. Is definitely CB1 on that Alabama team. I much prefer him to Kool-Aid McKinstry. And the Eagles, I know they don't do this. They don't draft corner very high in the draft. It's probably going to be Latham or Amarius Mims, right, at, at this pick. But they need corner so badly. And Arnold's a really, really good player. Falcons here at 23. I think we're just going to go Nate Wiggins. Not even really think about it too much. Wiggins has incredible CB1 potential. Not good against the run at all. But has the true, like, island type ability Great hustle player as well. That's something that stands out when you watch him. And just obviously very, very fast. You can see it with his closing speed. I trust him to play off coverage. I trust him to play man-to-man, -man, pressed up. Of course, life strength might be a bit of an issue at that point, but I think he can do it. And I think he's got true CB1 potential. And that's pretty good value at 23. Of course, via Minnesota, via Houston, via Cleveland. And then at number 24, you have the Dallas Cowboys. You've got great tackles available. I have a hard time believing it won't be one of these guys. I'm going to go with Marius Mims based on upside. He is about a top 10 player in this class, but has only really played eight games for Georgia. Injury could be a problem, but the potential is off the charts with the Marius Mims. I think he's a plug-and-play right tackle. I think he's refined as a player despite the limited experience. I think he's only going to get better, and I think he's athletic enough to potentially move to left tackle as well. Great athlete. And oftentimes, college right tackles are not athletic enough to move over to the le that left side. Mims is the exception. But you could also just play him at right tackle and be happy about it. You lose Tyron Smith. I know corners a need. I know, well, potentially. I know receivers a need. I know you need a center. I get it. Mims is just great value and has so much upside. As we get to the Packers at 25. I just think it's going to end up being a DB. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry makes a ton of sense. I'm really... Uh, J.C. Latham, I think this might be the uh, furthest we've ever seen him drop in one of my mock drafts. Does the team move up? The Cardinals are kind of an interesting team to do so here. I definitely like that potential. My, my thing about the Packers that's interesting here is I don't really think they take an offensive lineman in the first round, even though Barton makes a ton of sense, for example, because they just haven't ever done that, really. Receiver and O-line, they just don't take those guys in the first round. They don't. So, does Brian Gutekunst change his entire draft philosophy? I don't know. It seems, you know, weird to suggest that he would. I think the Cardinals could certainly move up here for a tackle. And Jonah Williams is a rental. And he's also not great. The Cardinals have so many picks. You could very easily move up. Very easily. And it may only cost number 104 to do it. Maybe number 90 as well because you need to incentivize them to move back and not just take their guy. So we're, we're going to go 27 and 90 for 25 here. Cardinals move up. Yes, I know you got Jonah Williams, but J.C. Latham's available at 25. That's a pretty great player. Plug and play right tackle. Mauler with in incredibly strong hands. Guys just do not get away from him when he latches on. And that's an incredibly great trait. He's huge, but has pretty good movement skills as well for his size. And the Cardinals, I think, you know, you go out there, you upgrade receiver at number four. I know you desperately need help on defense, but you probably didn't think J.C. Latham would be available, and you jump the bucks for him. I love that pick there for the Cardinals. At number 26, and of course, other teams could be wanting a tackle as well, like the Ravens. So uh, you don't want to have them trade up as well, even though they're not historically a big trade-up team. Uh, Bucks at 26. I think it could be a DB. And now, like, you get into the tricky spot of, hey, well, if the Packers want Kool-Aid McKinstry, he might not be there now. Because the Bucks could just definitely do that at 26. But the Bucks could also just certainly end up going with uh, an offensive lineman here at 26. The Bucks are another one of those teams it's tough for me to draft for because they need so many things. And I'm going to end up settling on Chop Robinson from Penn State. I do think he ends up being a first-rounder. 
I could see him getting to the second round for sure. But the upside is so immense with him. He's such an amazing athlete. Still developing as a pass rusher, but does have pretty good hands already. Just needs to, you know, learn some counter moves and, you know, as a run defender, you know, stay true to his gap responsibility. And he's going to end up being a pretty good player. These are coachable, teachable things. The athleticism is not. It's insane. The Bucks need more juice off the edge. Chop Robinson certainly can provide that. Packers at 27. I know, I know corner. I know we keep talking about corner. I get it. Here's the thing. The idea that they could add in Darius Robinson to their defense is intriguing. He is a six foot five, 290 pound hybrid defensive end. And that's, you know, three, four, five tech, right? Or, you know, he can also rush off the edge at times as well. He was dominant at the senior bowl. He's got big, big time potential and it got invited to the draft. This feels like a Packers type player. And I know you need help in the secondary, but you can do that later. It's not a great safety class. You have picks at 41 and 58. I honestly thought they even had another one in there as well. But two second round picks says that you don't need to take a safety at 27. You get Darius Robinson. I haven't seen this fit for them yet, but I actually really like it. Darius Robinson, versatile defensive end. Perfect fit for the Green Bay defense, if we're being honest. Goes there at 27. Bills at 28. Just got to be a receiver, doesn't it? I think it just has to be. And Adonai Mitchell tends to be the player I have to go for here usually. Wide receiver one potential. And I get I get why people don't like him. If he's not involved in the read and the progression, he's not really giving 100% or close to it. And he doesn't really offer a ton after the catch, but he is a really solid route runner. And with him, it's the overall athletic package of size, speed, and route running ability. He's nuanced as a route runner. I think he's got great potential. If you can unlock him, you're going to get a wide receiver one type player, an X receiver here at 28 for the Buffalo Bills. At 29, got the Lions. And the Lions are a team that's often tough to, or tough to draft for because they're good now. And they don't really have a ton of needs. They have pretty much figured guard out, bringing back Graham Glasgow. Now you lose Jonah uh, Jackson, I get that. Center, Frank Ragnow's got some injury stuff. But... I just think corner is such a big need for them. Kool-Aid McKinstry is a good player, but does he fit what I think the Lions are trying to do defensively? I think he's he's not that type of guy. He's, he's a little bit patient, a little bit passive at times. And I think, you know, the, the Lions are more so looking for that guy that's aggressive that can go out and get it like an Ennis Rakestraw. So what do the Lions do at 29? It's an interesting call. And you look on the edge here, and they could certainly use somebody... But I don't know that any of these guys are first-round caliber. But I'll tell you what is interesting. Oh, you guys are going to hate it. And I just don't care because it actually makes sense. <laughs> I am going to go Western Michigan's Marshawn Nealand at 29. Don't freak out. Some, If you guys know Marshawn Nealand, you might actually like this if you're a Lions fan. One, you get to keep him in state. That's always a fun storyline. But also... It's a position of need for a fringe top 30 player in this class. I know Dane Brugler has him as like the number 32 player in this draft. It's not a very strong edge class. And Nealand has unlimited potential. He's 6'3", 275, has inside-outside flexibility, base 4'3", defensive end, with juice, with giddy-up. Let me show you something about Marshawn Nealand. He could even end up going earlier than this. He, like, he could be a Packer, right? This feels like a Packers player. Had the highest overall athleticism score at the Combine. And 475 doesn't seem crazy until you realize he's 270 pounds. 418 20-yard shuttle, and the three-cone was 702. Why is that so crazy? The three-cone, of course, is an agility test. You can see some of the top guys in the draft. Kamari Laster got down to 662. Ricky Pierce saw Luke McCaffrey all in there. But look at where 702 lands you. That's right next to Jacob Cowing. Why is that impressive? Well, Jacob Cowing is 5'8", 170 with bricks in his pockets, right? This is a guy who's a pretty good athlete. 
He is exactly as agile as uh, Marshawn Nealand, who's 100 pounds heavier. And the tape is good. He's a high effort player. I think everything about Marshawn Nealand fits in Detroit. And I think for Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes, they don't care about taking their guy and reaching to, you know, the consensus big boards or whatever. Jameer Gibbs went at 12. Jack Campbell was a top 20 pick. They waited and got Brian Branch. Marshawn Nealon at 29, I could see it happening. His motor alone is a culture fit in Detroit. Ravens at 30. Tackle, such a big need for them. I know I go Tyler Guyton like all the time here, but I'm going to do it again. His upside is crazy. He is such a talented athlete. And could he move over to left tackle? Another guy who might be athletic enough to do it, but this is your long-term Morgan Moses replacement. Again, it just kind of makes too much sense for me. At number 31, have the Green, or not the Green Bay Packers. That's an SF. That's the 49ers. Excuse me. 49ers at 31. They need help across the offensive line, and you're going to get it. Graham Barton can play really every spot on the O-line. He's expected to move inside as well. Shorter arms, screams center or guard. I think you can do whatever you want him to do for the 49ers. He's just a talented player. Plays so well with leverage. He's a finisher. What do I mean by that? He he will drive you to the ground. He's a mauler in the run game. He's a guy who just has such great body control as well and is not small. Graham Barton is, what, 6'5", 315? Yeah, pretty big dude. And the Steelers, after the trade down, they hold on strong and they get Jackson Powers Johnson at 24. All right, at 32, 24 ranked player here on PFF. Maybe you would have taken him at 20. You get an extra pick and you still get your guy anyway at 32 to start at center for you. They need a center. I don't know if I can really provide too much more info. He's so great in space. He's a guy that just works you in the second level linebackers especially you get to the dbs in the third level it's over he's got great athleticism great power another mauler in a class full of them now to round two panthers at 33 receiver such a huge need and lad mcconkey's a really great player great route runner great speed really solid hands i know he got a little banged up didn't really produce as much because of injury but really great player and the Panthers just need somebody that can get open. Lad McConkey can get open. Should be a fun combo with Bryce Young. Patriots at 34. Well, of course, we went with Drake May at number three. And you still have needs almost everywhere. Could be a tackle here. Could be a guard if you want maybe Jordan Morgan. Kingsley Suamata'i is a fun fit for them. But I look at receiver, and I could certainly see this being a receiver spot. And... There are so many talented ones in this class. It's just tough to figure out where these guys are actually going to go. But I'm going to end up saying we need to protect our new quarterback. I'm going to go offensive line. We go Kingsley Suamataia there from BYU. Really, really good athlete. I think could potentially be a great guard as well, but is definitely athletic enough to stick out. 6'6", 315. If you look at the Patriots depth chart, it's not great at tackle. Connor McDermott is their expected starting left tackle and Suamataia might not be ready to go right away, but you have a really, really high potential with him. Again, incredible athlete. He's a cousin of Panay Sewell, which is kind of fun. I'd like to get him to Detroit at some point, but I think he could certainly be a first-round pick. Here he goes at 34 to a team that can wait on receiver. Like they did at number three, they can do it again. It's a stacked receiver class. And then the Cardinals at 35, turning the card for Kool-Aid McKinstry. Why not? Kool-Aid McKinstry is a potential first-round pick at corner. Again, very patient as a player. That's kind of the thing that stands out. Uh, but he's good in coverage. Can mirror, can match, and maybe not top-end speed for him, but is a good overall solid player, and the Cardinals need an upgrade in their secondary. I think Kool-Aid McKinstry fits the bill there. Commanders at 36. They could use a safety. They could certainly use a safety. Lose Cam Curl. So yeah, I think Tyler Newbin ends up making some sense there for me. Can play over the top, good ball hawking ability, and I think that'd be a nice combination with Derek Forrest there in Landover, Maryland. So, Chargers at 37. It's an interesting team because who knows what they're going to do in this draft. 
Do they take a receiver at five? Do they take an offensive tackle at five? Do they trade down? Do they get 11 and 23? Well, here, none of that happens. Take a receiver at five. And here you are at 37. Still have a big needed tight end. Is there one worth taking here? I don't know. Jatavion Sanders has lost some juice. Didn't test all that well. And and you watch him, you kind of worry, is this a guy that was schemed open more than he got open for himself? I love him as a player. Doesn't drop the football, but there are a little bit, uh, there are some concerns with him as a player a little bit. So I don't know that he ends up being the pick here, but someone I think could end up being the pick is a man Jim Harbaugh knows pretty well. That's Junior Colson from Michigan. I think he's LB1 in the draft. I've been saying that. I think there's a chance he goes in round one. You know, we don't really talk about linebacker and safety and tight end. These guys being first round picks. Brock Bowers, of course, was the difference here. And no safeties, no linebackers going round one for me. But yet, typically, we do see those positions going round one, especially linebacker. Seems one of those guys always sneaks in. Last year was Jack Campbell. Remember a few years ago now, maybe even like four or five years ago, Jordan Brooks sneaks into the first round out of Texas Tech. And you go like, what? And then he ended up being a really solid player. But he just it didn't seem like he was going to be a first round pick. Junior Colson's one of those guys who I like everything about him. He is amazing against the run. He's got good size. He's a really good athlete. And he's good in coverage. For a guy that's 250 pounds when every linebacker weighs, you know, 230 nowadays, this is a guy who runs as well as any of them. And for a team that could really use help on their defense, you could really use a Mike linebacker. Well, Jim Harbaugh keeps it the same one he had at Michigan. Junior Colson, 37th player off the board here, and he is so good. I'm a huge fan of him. I know the linebacker class isn't anything special. I totally get that. You know, Edger and Cooper's got some juice, kind of like more of a 4-3 outside linebacker, in my opinion. Peyton Wilson's pretty good, but the injury stuff's really bad and definitely plays or definitely ran faster than he plays at times. And I'm not a big Jeremiah Trotter guy. I like Cedric Gray. I like Jalen Ford, obviously. Hook him like Trevin Wallace, like Jordan McGee, but it's not a great linebacker class. Junior Colson, I think, could definitely be the first one off the board and goes here at 37. At number 38, Tennessee Titans are on the clock and they could still use wide receiver. And, well, there are some good ones still available at 38, that's for sure. But with DeAndre Hopkins still there, with the addition to Calvin Ridley, Still have Traylon Burks. I'm not sure you have to turn in the card for a receiver at 38. I don't think you have to. This could actually be a double dip on tackle, as crazy as that may seem. But I'll tell you, I think the Titans desperately need some help on their interior defensive line. You lose a guy that was so good for you in Danico Autry. And while you can't directly replace him, I think Darius Robinson would be an awesome replacement. He's not available. So go for a different type of player. And that's Michigan's Chris Jenkins. I think there's a good chance that he ends up being the third defensive tackle off the board. I think he could even go as high as the first round. He's here at 38, back-to-back Michigan players off the board. Jenkins is very different from his dad, who is, of course, an all-pro type player. 6'3", 305. Chris Jenkins, the other one, was like 360. But uh, Chris Jenkins has athleticism for days, super strong, and uh, can certainly impact the game as a pass rusher long-term, you're hoping. So Titans, I know they want to improve this position, and Chris Jenkins happens to be a really good player on the board just makes a ton of sense. Panthers at 39 via the Giants and the Brian Burns trade. Lad McConkey, of course, uh, was their first selection in this draft. And they went out, they upgraded the O-line. I still think you could take a center because you're moving a guard over to center. And that could be a little bit weird. Signed Damian Lewis, signed Robert Hunt to a monster deal. So Austin Corbett is moving over to center. Maybe he doesn't take to the, to the position. Maybe you end up going with a center here. But you also have some significant other needs, in my opinion, as well. Edge, obviously, being one of them. Linebacker being one of them. You lose Frankie Louvu. I think Edger and Cooper is kind of a fun pick here. And it could definitely be what I opt to do at this spot. Cooper kind of has a Frankie Louvu type play style in the fact that he's a good blitzer, but can also drop in space. Cooper, not quite as big as Frankie Luvu. He's 6'3", 230. They're not totally incomparable. Luvu, I think, is 235, 240. But I think everybody wants Edger and Cooper in the second round. Everybody does. However, if everybody wants him, it means he shouldn't be available for that long. 
Uh, I'm going to go defense here. I'm going to go Edger and Cooper out of Texas A&M with a linebacker, Junior Colson, maybe going a little bit earlier than you expect. This makes sense to see a bit of a run as Cooper is the second linebacker off the board, or true linebacker, of course. And I'm not really counting these edge off ball, or excuse me, on the ball outside linebackers as linebackers in the case of, of course, your Chop Robinson. He's not an, a linebacker, even though he's going to play 3-4 outside linebacker. You get what I'm saying. Commander's back on the clock at 40. Well, we address safety. Edge, absolutely a need. Because you traded away, you know, all the ones you had. But you bring in some via free agency. I get that. Uh, Dorrance Armstrong Jr. was one. I think you could still go offensive line here. A tackle's a need. And so is guard. And I think Jordan Morgan gives you the flexibility to figure it out. Maybe you try him at left tackle to start, of course, at Arizona. But you still could use an upgrade at left guard over Allegretti. So, of course, I know they brought him in, right? But... Uh, Jordan Morgan is either an upgrade at guard or a potential starting left tackle. Everyone seems to like him better at guard. I can understand it. He's just someone that gets beat inside a little bit too much when you watch him, you know, and that could be a problem when you're out in space as a, a blindside, you know, protecting or pass protecting left tackle. So if you're going to be threatened by speed and not able to adjust and then beat inside as a result, like you're probably just better suited as a guard, but you could try him at tackle and, and see what happens. He's a good player. First round type talent, but probably at guard. So you get you get your option there with Jordan Morgan of what you're going to do. But I think they do need to address offensive line. They do so here at 40. And again, a player that could go in the first round. At 41, Packers on the clock. Or safety, Tyler Newbin off the board. Went defensive line and Darius Robinson at 27. Could still use offensive line help, but I, I find a tough time believing that this won't be a DB. And even with the addition of Xavier McKinney, you could still out, uh, still go out and get a safety, and that's what we're going to do here. And you might be taking the best one in the draft in Jaden Hicks out of Washington State. He's a guy that's awesome in the box, super athletic, and can play over the top as well. I think it's a perfect fit with Xavier McKinney. And McKinney was kind of like this great box player at Alabama, ended up really getting better in coverage and was able to play true free safety for the Giants. Jaden Hicks is someone that I think has a similar skill set to Xavier McKinney and is a better athlete. So Hicks ends up going here at 41. And now you have a pretty formidable safety duo in Xavier McKinney and Jaden Hicks here out of Washington State. Texans at 42. Man, did they get better in the offseason. Joe Mixon's a cool pickup, but of course it's all about Stefan Diggs and Daniil Hunter. Those are the two big ones. Danico Autry on the interior. I mean, they just made a ton of really cool moves to make their team a lot better. And, you know, how can you not get excited about that team? I think the Texans could use a corner, but specifically they could really go out and get a nickel corner. And you're not going to find a better one in this draft than Mike Sainer Steele uh, from Michigan. Sainer Steele is such a great player. A lot of people have come to Mike Hilton. If you look at what he did with the Bengals and Steelers, really, really great player, can tackle. A little bit undersized, but very instinctive, or instinctive very, very good uh, at just doing everything you'd want a nickel corner back to be able to do. That's that's just having an innate feel for the game. You can come up and tackle. You can play in coverage. You can cover guys that are bigger or smaller than you. But typically in the NFL, you're not going to find someone smaller than 5'10", 5'9", 182. But he is just so good and feels like a Texan when you, you think about, you know, what Danico or D'Amico Ryans would be asking him to do. I think he's a perfect Desmond King replacement long term. I think he's such a good player. And you look at Brian Branch going at 45 last year and that looking like a mistake with how good of a player he was. We knew it during the draft. We saw it in year one as a rookie. Sainer still could have a similar impact for the Texans as a rookie. Boundary corner, certainly an option, but we go for the nickel in there at 42. Falcons back on the clock at 43. We've been picking so much for them so far. And of course, the first picks, Nate Wiggins and Dallas Turner. Really looking to upgrade the defense. And we're going to continue to upgrade the defense. And with the Falcons at 43, I'm going to go Braden Fisk from Florida State. Fisk is a big dude with short arms. Kind of built like a T-Rex, but every bit as scary as one. Explosive. Very fast. Tested great. Had a dominant senior bowl, as we keep saying for some of these guys. And I think that really does help your stock. I think he could get pushed up into the top 50. Is he as good as Ruka Rororo? I don't know, though, though. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> or Brandon Doralis, right? Mike Hall. 
I think Devondre Sweat's really going to fall. But um, Fisk has big-time potential as a pass rusher if he can get beyond the short arms thing, which could be a problem in the NFL. Saw it with Ed Oliver at first, but he ended up being a great pro. Fisk could be the same. Raiders at 44. And your first pick, of course, was Talisa Fuaga out of Oregon State to play right tackle or guard for you, potentially. Still need help at corner. Still could take a tackle, even with Fuaga. Maybe he plays guard, obviously. But, you know, I look at their defense, and I think Antonio Pierce is going to want an upgrade there. And there are some really good players available. I look at corner. I think that particularly stands out as something the Raiders could certainly upgrade. And you got some good ones available. Max Melton, Andrew Phillips, probably a slot. Uh, Ennis Rakestraw, Kamari Lassiter. I, I really like these guys. And I will end up going Ennis Rakestraw Jr. here from Mizzou. Uh, he's somebody that's super physical. And if you look at the Raiders, that feels like it's going to fit the mold of what they're going to want with Antonio Pierce. They really need an upgrade at corner. Rakestraw is athletic and physical. Feels like it fits the mold there in Vegas. Saints at 45, of course, took a tackle inside the top 15. And they still have needs in the trenches. You could still uh, take another tackle here, honestly. But I also think they could look to upgrade... Uh, their defensive line. And I'm going to go with Clemson's Rook Aroraro. Seen a Clemson defensive tackle for the Saints before, a little bit higher with Brian Brzee. Aroraro is really good, really fun name to say. And uh, he's a really talented athlete that could combine with teammate Brian Brzee and form one of the better interior defensive line duos in the league. At 46, we got the Colts. And the Colts are an interesting team here. We went with corner slash safety Cooper DeGene at 15 and I'll tell you Xavier Leggett just feels like a Colts type player here and that's because of he's a really great athlete and that's just typically what the Colts have done high in the draft I know the kind of late breakout age with him but he is such a great player that I'm okay with drafting him here in the top 50 super explosive great after the catch can win down the field and I just think when I'm looking at which receiver to give the Colts, Troy Franklin feels like a moot point. They have Alec Pierce. Big time D threat. Roman Wilson can play on the outside, but might be an NFL slot. You got Josh Downs. Ricky Pearsall's a decent option. Another really solid athlete. Keon Coleman, I'm not sure it's going to be athletic enough for Chris Ballard, but Leggett, you're not going to have that problem. And he ends up being the pick at 46. Giants back on the clock at 47. This has worked out pretty well for them because, you know, you could certainly use an upgrade on the O-line. Took a receiver in Roma Dunze at number six. And there are some really good guards available. I think he ignores Zach Frazier because you don't really need a center. But it's pick your, your guard here. Which do you want? Christian Haynes is great. Cooper Beebe is great. Christian Mahogany is a New Jersey kid. Mason McCormick's got untapped potential. There are great guards in this class. And the Giants just can do whatever they want with this pick. But I think guard would be in their best interest. Dominic Pooney listed at tackle. Is, yeah, he's another one of these great guard prospects. Probably will be a guard. So I don't really think you can go wrong here. I'm going to lean towards Christian Haynes from UConn. I think he's a really, really good player. I think he's a really good fit with the Giants. And if you look at their offensive line now, from left to right, it would be Andrew Thomas, obviously. Christian Haynes, probably at left guard. John uh, Michael Schmitz, who you drafted in the second round as a center last year. Right guard's now going to be John Runyon Jr., who you signed from the Packers. And right tackle's a combo of Evan Neal and Jermaine Illuminor. If Neal takes a step up, fantastic. And if he doesn't, Jermaine Illuminor is fine. Fine, right? So Christian Haynes feels like the missing piece. Terrible O-line that did get better, and hopefully this really improves it. You have one of the best left tackles in football. Need John Michael Schmitz to play better. And then you have a, a solid center, of course. Took him pretty high last year. And uh, John Runyon Jr., you can do worse. Christian Haynes, hopefully going to be a good player. And then right tackle is kind of up in the air a little bit. Uh, at 48, I think, I think I might go Keon Coleman here, you know. Keon Coleman's a fun player. Really like him. I think he's going to be a top 50 selection. You know, would have really considered him the Giants at 47 had we not taken a receiver at number 6. Keon Coleman, I think, can be a wide receiver one. 
You have questions about his ability to separate, but he is athletic. And of course, we can talk about him being slow, running slow. Well, at the combine in the gauntlet trail at receiver, an actual test of, you know, play speed more so, he was the fastest receiver of anybody in terms of GPS time. He's confident in his ability to catch the ball. He's got arguably the best jump ball ability in this draft. I would say he does. And it feels like a good fit in Jacksonville. And, you know, you look at them bringing in Gabe Davis, that's your deep threat. Keon Coleman doesn't have to do that. I like what they have going with Christian Kirk. Keon Coleman feels like the missing piece. And now you upgrade a wide receiver and cornerback in the top 50. I think, I think you feel pretty good about that. Bengals at 49. You have definite question marks at the wide receiver position. T. Higgins is going to play there in 2024, it seems. I don't think he's going to get traded. I would really, really doubt it. But that's a rumor. But you still need more outside of Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. And T. Higgins is not expected to be there. I think adding... Any of these receivers I could really sell myself on. And I'm going to go Troy Franklin today. Another great field-stretching receiver. He can certainly win down the field. And with Jamar Chase, I think that offers a pretty fun combo. Big-time speed to add to the offense. And they need help at receiver. Eagles at 50. Well, we took DB in the first round at 22. Could this finally be where the Eagles go for their developmental tackle? And the answer for me is yes, I think so. I'm going to go Kieran Amagaji from Yale. He just has untapped potential. He's got obvious NFL size at 6'5", 315, 320. And it has times where he does show up and flash as a finisher. Um, you know, I've seen some highlights. That's all I can get of Yale film, if I'm being honest with you. But a lot of NFL evaluators seem to love him and his untapped potential. And of course, you team him up with Jeff Stoutland should be a great combo he's your eventual starting right tackle you'd have to imagine and he's just the sky's the limit with him again I have not watched him more than just a couple of highlights because that's all I can find but everyone seems to love him and that's that's the analysis there Steelers at 51 also have 64 courtesy of the Kansas City Chiefs here in this mock draft at 51 well we took a center at 32 still could use a tackle could use a receiver I think could still even use a corner. And there are certainly some great ones still available. I'll tell you what. Getting Xavier Worthy into this offense, or ex-Xavier Worthy as he's called, Xavier Worthy, getting him into the offense could be really fun. There's so many great receivers. I'm not really having them fly off the board here. Kind of going some different directions here. This is interesting. Well, Michael Penix also still available. I'm going to go Roman Wilson here. I think Wilson's a really good fit with the Steelers. Yes, he's only... 5'10", 190, he's not six foot. We looked into this before. He's, I think he came into the combine at 5'10". So he's a little bit smaller, but he blocks his ass off in the run game. I think Mike Tomlin's going to love that. I think he's... It, well, first of all, he's got great speed. But I think he's a great foil to George Pickens in this offense. You got someone that can be the smaller, big-time speed route runner. And yes, route running is not super polished because he needs to figure out that he doesn't need to run 100% every stage of the route. You know, that's not exactly how you get open, but just being faster than a guy, you got to set him up. It, it, route running such a nuanced thing. Every little thing is, it, it's down to the millisecond for timing. And uh, that can, you know, get you open. But if you run just everything at 100%, it's not going to be super hard to track if the guy has speed to catch up to you. And oftentimes they don't because Roman Wilson's super fast. But I think it's a fun combo into this offense. You get someone that Russell Wilson can throw moon balls to. And uh, Wilson's a great player. You obviously trade Deontay Johnson. You need something else there. Roman Wilson is the guy there for me today. Rams at 52. I'm going to go Michael Penix. I'm going to go Michael Penix. Penix has a really strong arm. He tested fairly well at his pro day, but didn't really show that ability on tape. Isn't great under pressure. Didn't really see a ton of it at Washington. And, of course, has the injury history. But you don't take a QB in the first round. Still building around Stafford. But if he gets injured, Michael Penix can actually be a competent backup to step in uh, and be the guy. And maybe your long-term guy as well. So, it's an interesting fit there. I struggle with where to actually go for Michael Penix. But that ends up being the spot. Eagles at 53 back up again after taking Amagaji. I think this could be a linebacker. 
I think this could be linebacker, and I think Peyton Wilson just is probably the best one available. The injury stuff's a bit scary. He's constantly banged up, but the athleticism is crazy and could develop into being quite a solid player for Philly. Browns at 54. I think this does end up being a tackle. It seems like they're doing a lot of homework on the top tackles. This is their first pick in the draft, and you have some really solid ones available. You know Patrick Paul from U of H. Paul's another larger-than-life human on the O-line, 6'7", 3'15", and the Browns are in a bit of a weird spot at left tackle. Jedrick Wills probably ends up being a free agent, so you could just certainly need to get a left tackle soon. Patrick Paul was really not someone who allowed a ton of pressure and has obviously tremendous size. Could be the pick here at 54 for Cleveland. Dolphins back on the clock at 55. Of course, went with the defensive lineman in Byron Murphy out of Texas at 21. Here at 55, yes, you could certainly use an upgrade on the O-line. And I think we are going to take a guard. You lose Robert Hunt, but you got some great guards still available. You got Zach Frazier at center. However, however, they signed a center. Went out and got um, Aaron Brewer from Tennessee. So you don't necessarily need a center here, but you could upgrade at guard. And Cooper Beebe would be a big upgrade at guard. Really fun player. Can really move well out in space. And then that sets up the Cowboys pretty beautifully to go Zach Frazier at 56. Of course, at 24, took the big tackle of Marius Bims. We're double dipping on O-line. Frazier kind of sticking around a little bit. It's just because he plays center. We saw Joe Tittman and John Michael Schmitz fall a little bit last year. Frazier's a great player. Ends up going here at 56. The Cowboys got two starters on the O-line with their first two picks. I mean, that's... That's just great. You're not going to really get better than that. Bucks at 57. Worst one with Chop Robinson, 26. Think you could upgrade the secondary with this next one. I like Kamari Lassiter a lot. And at 57, I love him. So the Bucks upgrade a corner. You trade Carlton Davis, of course. Corner was a need anyway. And we really just went all in on defense here with the first two. Packers back on the clock. Went defensive line. Went with, of course, defensive back in Jaden Hicks. Could finally take an offensive player here. Uh, but we're going to go defense again. I'm going to go Max Melton from Rutgers. Max Melton is a super athlete. I mean, a lot of great athletes in this class. Max Melton, no exception. And if you look at the Green Bay Packers, obvious needs in the secondary, right? But they're, they're, they're losing so much. You can only bring in so much to replace those guys. Corner, can you count on Eric Stokes to stay healthy? We know about Jair Alexander. But Max Belton has inside-outside flexibility. And I think that makes him a really, really fun fit here. So Max Melton to the Packers at 58. And they continue to go defense-focused. Well, bringing a new DC from Boston College. Heavily relied on press. You know, TJ Tampa could be that guy. I don't really view him as a second-round type player. So Max Melton ends up being the pick there. Javon Bullard's a really good player as well. Then we get to the Texans at 59. Mike Sainersil was their first-round pick or their, well, their first pick, first round, of course, they traded out of. And the idea of adding Michael Hall to this team is really fun because I look at getting into Nico Autry. He's a great player, great pass rusher on the interior. You have Will Anderson Jr. You have Daniil Hunter. Well, you go out and get another really, really good pass rusher, this one on the interior. Mike Hall can get after the QB. That's no question. A little bit undersized. Maybe that's why he falls here to 59, but pretty much finalizes the Texans defensive line and that's a really fun thing Bills at 60 of course took a receiver at 28 I think the Bills could certainly uh, look to upgrade their secondary here but we're running out of great players in the secondary however if you look at safety look at corner I like the fit of Javon Bullard Javon Bullard is a really really good player can play in the slot can play over the top as well a little bit undersized but tested well He's a really, really fun player to watch. And the Bills, they just lost so much talent. You need to bring in somebody in the secondary like Javon Bullard, in my opinion. At 61, the Detroit Lions. People might be upset about taking Marshawn Neal into 29, but the potential is there. And of course, the Lions just take their guy. At 61, with all these receivers still sticking on the board, how is that even possible, right? There are so many good ones still available. And I'm going to go with University of Texas standout, Xavier Worthy. Set the record, of course, for 
uh, the 40-yard dash in NFL Combine history, but also plays very fast. But he's much more than a deep threat if you watch him at Texas. Is awesome after the catch, can win underneath. His hands are good. Maybe not in contested catch situations, but he played with a broken hand in 2022. Didn't really drop the football very much in 2023. Hands really are not much of a concern with him, but he's not going to be somebody that goes up and catches jump balls. But you already have Jamison Williams. You you add the speed of Worthy into this offense. Amon Ross St. Brown to play the slot. Those two on the outside will threaten vertically, and Amon Ross St. Brown is going to be even more open underneath with the safeties pushed back, with the corners pushed back. Everyone will need to respect the speed of the Lions on offense. And Worthy's not just a deep threat. Offers significant return value as well. Definitely worth being picked here at 61 to the Lions. At 62, I'm thinking about going receiver again. Uh, my buddy Wheels, big Florida and Baltimore Ravens fan. And Ricky Pearsall's here, and he's worth a pick here at 62. Can play the slot, can play on the outside, solid route runner with great athleticism as well. Can definitely catch the ball in traffic, has highlight real plays for days. I mean, he has one incredible overhand catch that was like nothing I've ever seen as he got smacked, held on to the ball. Wild stuff, and uh, worth being a second round pick here as we get to the 49ers at 63. And can I just start running these receivers off the board? Well, there are Brandon Ayuk trade rumors right now. I don't really see much validity to them. I think more than likely Debo Samuel would be the one to get moved. But also, like part of the reason your offense is so successful is because you have those guys. But you could use more help at receiver. And I'm going to help them out. And I'm going to give them a vertical field stretcher in Tez Walker from UNC. The tape's really good. I think I could see him going earlier than this and drop the ball a little bit at the Senior Bowl. I don't really care too much about it because he can get open. He's got rare movement skills for his size, which is, you know, 6'2", 6'3", over 200. Can really, really get down the field. And a super fun player to watch. Transfer from Kent State. He's a good one. And then to wrap up this first round, got the Steelers at 64. And this should probably be a tackle. And, I mean, Roger Rosengarten could be the one. Roger Rosengarten started at right tackle for Washington. 6'6", 300, good movement skills, really good athlete, and works his way into the second round. Steelers upgrade their entire offense here. Um, of course, no corners, but you uh, go out and you trade for Dante Jackson. Maybe you don't need to take one this high in the draft. So, this is my mock draft. Pretty fun one today. Really ran some receivers off the board to end the second round. But when there's so many good receivers, it might not mean that all of them get drafted all inside the top 50. So we'll see what ends up happening. That's the mock draft. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.